there, ladies. Welcome. Thank you so much uh, for coming out this evening on this glorious Minnesota day. Um, uh, I would uh, like to just uh, do a one quick introduction. I want to introduce Eva Kendrick. Eva Kendrick is uh, an HRC field organizer, field director, and she is going to be in Minnesota making sure that we get our equality candidates elected. She's going to be working for Dan, working for all of the equality candidates you guys are familiar with. She just flew in today. It's her first day in Minnesota. She got this lovely weather. Um, she was a field director for some campaign in Alabama where some senator named Doug Jones got elected. So, and for being here tonight. Um, we have two very distinguished folks with us tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to you know. I met uh, one about a year and a half ago. I met one 20 minutes ago. But uh, uh, Seth Bolton is, um, is a congressman from Massachusetts. Um, Seth has an incredibly interesting background. Um, he went to Harvard um, and then immediately joined the Marines. Now, that's a typical career path for somebody who goes to Harvard if you don't know it. But uh, joined the Marines served in Iraq, um, and uh, eventually uh, eventually made his way back to Massachusetts and ran for Congress. Um, he has formed an organization that supports veterans who are running for Congress around the country. Uh, and they're supporting 20 veterans, and so Seth is going around and helping and campaigning and, and, and doing that work. So it's very exciting work. Uh, these, uh, the folks that they're supporting are all in the vein of Dan, uh, who, who you'll meet in a minute. but. Um, Obviously, they are uh, they are supporters of the human rights campaign and supporters of the equality for LGBTQ folks. So, um, uh, and I'm very excited. We're very excited to have uh, uh, Seth join us and, uh, and work for Dan here in Minnesota today. But uh, please welcome Congressman Seth. Thank you. So, Congressman, thank you so much for inviting us uh, to your beautiful, very artistic home. It's uh, stunning. And uh, it's an honor to be here in support of Dan. Uh, I'll be brief in my remarks because you're not here to see this guy from Massachusetts who doesn't need your help in this re-election. Uh, <laughs> here to support this guy. And, and I, I think we would love, love to take some questions. So we'll try to be both brief with our introductions and then, um, and then go to questions. So yes, I did go to Harvard. I actually got a physics degree, uh, which for everybody in life who sees my resume, who sees my resume and not my transcript makes me sound very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went into the Marines and served as an infantry officer in Iraq. And I didn't go in with any political aspiration whatsoever. I hadn't studied in school, I hadn't volunteered on a campaign. But when I was in Iraq, I felt like I saw the consequences of failed leadership in Washington in very human, personal ways uh, on the ground. And so I came back, I, I worked in business school. And, and then, like every aspiring Massachusetts politician, I took a job in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> I moved to Dallas. When I was down there, I got a call from this amazing woman named Emily Cherniak, who's founded this group called New Politics. It's trying to get service veterans, and not just military veterans, national service veterans, so City Year, Teach for America, Peace Corps veterans as well, to run for office because her theory is that if you have people who've already put their, uh, put their lives or, or a lot of their time on the line for the country, then maybe they know a little bit about public service and will do a better job than some of the folks already in Washington. And so she said I should take on this 18-year incumbent in Massachusetts. I was too naive to know that you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> um, the entire Massachusetts political establishment told me uh, that I would, one, lose the race. So I was trying to take an 18-year incumbent in my own party. I would lose, <coughs> lose the race. <laughs> two, excuse me, I would never be involved in Massachusetts politics again because I dared to take on this incumbent. And Really, what they were saying to me is that do not participate in the democracy you just risked your life to defend. And that's wrong. And we had to work really hard. We won that primary, uh, won the general election in, in 2014. And after two years in Congress just trying to do a good job for the 6th District of Massachusetts, November of 2016 was a wake up call for me as it was for so many other Americans. And I decided that I've got to get involved in the political side of things, not just the policy side, not just doing a good job in Washington for my district but to try to fundamentally change Congress by getting better people elected. And so my two goals with this group of 20 veterans who are running in key swing districts across the country is one, to help take back the House, to put a check on this president, to restore some balance to Washington, but two, to fundamentally change our Congress by getting better leaders into office. 
And leadership is what Dan Tina is all about. He grew up in St. Paul. Uh, he served in the Army. He served in the Pentagon. Um, he has been a leader and a public servant his entire life. And so there's a lot of other details of his background and his bio that, that might matter. But I think what matters most in politics today is that he has the courage to be a leader in a very tough environment in Washington. And that's what we need in Washington, D.C. It's what you need out of your representatives right here. And so with that, Dan Tate. Tom and Kent, again, want to echo your long support. Like it's much more than tonight. You've been there from the beginning. And it's incredible to think from that first meeting uh, to San Francisco meeting just a couple weeks ago. This is where we are today. And it's, it's, it does take a village to win, and you were very early part of it. So thank you. Uh, and hello to all of you. Um, my name is Dan Fee, and if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, and I am the DFL candidate for Congress in the 1st District of Minnesota, a district that we will keep blue in November, and it is a place uh, to me that is home. I, I was born in St. Paul, I grew up in Red Wing in southern Minnesota, and so the, the thing I like to start with real briefly is to talk about parade season, which we are mercifully <laughs> ending. Uh, right now, I just walked in my, my 56th parade of the campaign so <laughs> far. Uh, but for me as a kid, this is, this is where it started. Uh, it was when I was four years old that I figured out what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, my dad uh, was a city attorney in Red Wing, got a call from Rudy Perpich uh, asking to run for state senate. It really meant be a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> and my dad stepped forward and did it, and I hated it. Uh, because that meant, as a four-year-old, I had to be physically contained everywhere I went, uh, and that was really hard. And I know this really well, because I have a four-year-old now, and this is full <laughs> karma coming back around on me today. Um, but being a four-year-old, I was in a parade, it was a Fourth of July day parade. I was in the backseat of a convertible, because that's what you do with candidates and their families. There they are on display. And I remember putting my hand out and it burning because it was a red convertible and just burned oh. my hand and I lost it. Oh. And my dear mother, wonderful woman, uh, first of all said, shut up. <laughs> um, and then she gave me context. And I'll, I'll remember it uh, to the day I die. She said, we're doing this for your dad. Your dad is doing this for other people. And it was this beautiful, simple summary of public service. And that's when I started following my dad everywhere I, he, that, that he went on a campaign. And I suddenly realized that's what Southern Minnesota is. It's a place that serves each other, that everyone takes care of each other. And that's the value that I've lived my whole life with. That's the reason that on 9-11, when I watched the Pentagon burn, I decided to join the Army. It's the reason that I decided to teach middle schoolers in Gary, Indiana, which was a much tougher challenge in a lot of ways compared to being in Iraq. <laughs> Uh, and it's the reason that I, again, took an oath to, to support and defend the Constitution in the Pentagon, working on behalf of service members. And uh, like Seth, I saw a lot of things along the way. I saw the impact of Washington, D.C. on far-flung places like Gary, Indiana, or like Iraq, that the decisions made in Washington, or more importantly, the indecisions, have life and death consequences on people's lives. And that's the, the thing I carried along the whole way, because there is not enough of Congress today that's, that's made up of people that understand the consequences of policy. And I want to take a moment of reflection of the chaos that we're living in right now. And the fear that I, I mean, every day Southern Minnesotans living with right now. Fear about what their health care is going to be tomorrow. Fear, fear about their wages. Or just fear about what tomorrow is going to bring. Or fear in the idea of the gains that we've made, the progress we've made in the realm of equality. In the realm of women's rights. These gains seem so much more at risk than perhaps ever before. And it's this moment of chaos that I like to remind myself, I'm a student of history, and this is the message I leave all of you with, we've been here before as a state. Minnesota becomes a state, this is a trivia question, we'll see how we do in this. Minnesota becomes a state in one year. 1858. That's right, 1858. Three years later, President Lincoln puts out a call to the whole country. I need an army. Governor Ramsey, first governor of Minnesota from St. Paul, puts out that same call, and within one week, 1,000 Minnesotans from all over the state show up to volunteer. Most other states have to start a draft, but not Minnesota. And these Minnesotans come from all over the state, but especially southern Minnesota. They come from Red Wing, they come from Winona, they come from Faribault, they come from Mankato, and they show up to volunteer. And they become the first Minnesota volunteer infantry regiment. They have an incredible campaign in the Civil War, the First Battle of Bull Run, Second Battle of Bull Run, Antietam, and finally in Gettysburg. And Minnesotans are, we are a humble people, but we don't talk about this a lot. It was on the second day of Gettysburg that the first Minnesota is on the left flank of the Union line. 
They are all that stands between a union defeat and victory right there. And they're outnumbered by some estimates five to one. And they're given a very, very simple order in military terms. Hold the line. And southern Minnesotans do just that. So much so that the Battle of Gettysburg actually has a third day. And it's again Minnesotans who are in the dead center of the Union line facing Pickett's charge. And again, they hold the line. Because in 1863, Minnesota saved the Union. We're humble, but I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in because of races like ours, and yes, as we've talked about, a lot of other races going on in the state, Minnesota has the exact same task to hold the line. To win these races and be the check and balance that must arrive to Washington, D.C. in time for our country. Because that spirit of that first Minnesota resides still in the Minnesota first, but I need your help. And that's why we're here. Even though you may not reside in southern Minnesota, the impact that you can have here by your donations, by your questions, by your engagement, or if you want to come door knock, you can do that too. <laughs> it matters. Because people are open to hearing two different messages, I have found. They're, they're, they are open to looking at their health care prices, their wages, and that feeling of fear, and they're open to hearing a message of division. Of, say, of someone saying it is someone else's fault. It's a compelling message to hear. They're also hearing, open to hearing a message of hope, of how the Democratic Party, if given a chance, can make their health care better, can raise wages, and can provide a hope that washes away any sense of fear. That, those are the stakes. Because if Congress can, can become a functional body of government, again, here in 2018, that's all we will remember this year. And that's a chance for institutional change that represented by someone like here who's leading the way on this, that I couldn't have done this without. So that's why we're here. And so with that, I will stop, I will pause, and we will take questions. As long as you can, you've got your busy scope today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, we'll take a few questions, and then Zach in the back there will make the other <laughs> Please, but please, any questions you have. <clears throat> what are you doing to get the younger voters to turn out? Fantastic. Which is key to a Democratic victory. It is, and, and as you know, in this district, Tim Walls won by less than a point last time around. We have had a concentrated effort since the caucus night to make sure Winona State, uh, Minnesota State, Mankato, and Gustavus have been involved in our campaign. We try to defeat this very simple idea that your voice doesn't matter, your vote doesn't matter, and have had interns, organizers be a part of our campaign, and they have been on campus since last spring, but especially this fall for voter registrations at every way, shape, and form. And what you see out of the Secretary of State's office is true in southern Minnesota. Young people are registering to vote at an incredibly high rate, and I have a strong feeling that they'll vote for Democrats come November. Thank you. In 2003, uh, I was part of the invasion of Iraq with uh, and uh, my oldest granddaughter was in third grade at that time. Now she's married with a child and a great grandfather. And the war keeps going on in North Iraq and Afghanistan. It's pretty discouraging. And, and it just seems like the Pentagon has no idea of what they're doing or how to do it. No idea of what winning or the strategy should be. So it's pretty discouraging. And I thought it would get better. I mean, once I came back and started speaking out with the right veterans against the war, where it hasn't happened. And at the same time, as I was speaking out against the war for the idea of the I spoke out to the repeal of the U.S. Don't Tell, and I met some of the people in here uh, because, uh, because it affected me. I've been military for three decades in the VA. So I spoke out for that, and now I see the war going on, and I kind of see the uh, LGBT service members you know, catching some more flag, especially the transgenders. They want to serve, they should serve, and it's just discouraging to see what, what's, what's happening with the Republicans. You know, I kind of like to hear what your thoughts are. I read your national security uh, issues thing on your website, and I got to tell you, Dan, it's the best one of any candidate in the state by far. So I thank you for that and for being here. I'd like to hear your thoughts on both the wars without end and also you know, what's happening, especially the transgender. Yeah. So we, we had a chance, uh, so this is Veterans Week uh, for our campaigns. We had a chance to do a, a roundtable in Mankato today. Had, pretty incredible diverse perspective of just perspectives. Um, and then we, we were uh, on a, a community college campus today to talk about too. So this is pretty fresh, fresh in my mind. And I don't know if you want to, I'm happy to jump in. So this is the way I look at it. More than, more than you're a third grader, now an adult, now, now a parent. Uh, this is a date that I want to make sure we're, we're well aware of. 
as of this last September 11th, 2018, the first American-born child born after 9-11-2001 can now enlist with their parents' permission to fight and die for their country. So think about that in generational terms. An entire generation has passed with the nation at war. And from a, a moral consciousness perspective, that to me is unconscionable. I have a seven-year-old, and the idea that we could be at war in perpetuity until he's old enough to serve is, is, is something that drives me every single day. But this is, this is more than that. This is, there's a financial toll to this, too. Uh, and we talk about this, if we ended the war on terror today, which it would be very difficult to do, there's $5 trillion that will have been spent towards that act. And this is a Congress problem because it is in Congress that the authority to use force around the world given to now three different presidents, that's where it came from. A, a blank check essentially in 2001. And it's an issue for me that I would like to lead on if given the chance to serve alongside Congressman Moult on the Armed Services Committee. Because that's where, if, if we're not going to talk about limiting the use of force on behalf of this president, I don't know when we, when we will next. And this is a perfect time to talk about what the civilian role in leadership is here. Because the military's job is to execute the strategy of a civilian-led military. And we have kind of, that has kind of flipped on its head. And we have, we have deferred to military leadership. But that's backwards. Civilians are supposed to bear the burden and shoulder the burden of whether or not we should be at war. And that's a, that's a responsibility, I think, that has not been taken seriously enough over the last 17 years, and I intend to do that differently myself. Absolutely. I worked for the transgender clerk. I worked. It's been flip back and forth, and I'm not even sure what you're doing. My view is this comes to the military in general. It is incredibly hard to recruit into the military. An incredibly small amount of people want to do it in the first place, and an incredibly small amount of people are qualified to do it in the first place because of, of health reasons alone. And if we are doing anything, and this goes for this goes for the LGBT community, this goes for recent immigrants, if we are doing anything to deter any young person from joining the military, it's not just a moral wrong, it's a national security imperative that we stop doing. Because this is a volunteer force that has shouldered an incredible burden for 17 straight years that people don't have to join in the first place. So as someone who worked directly on the, the, the policy to have transgender service members serve openly, I want to see that become law at some point in the future. And we want to advocate for that as such. And the idea of one standard, being able to meet a standard, is what qualifies someone to be serving in the military. I just want to make a couple, just two quick comments on this. Uh, I, I did four tours in Iraq. And when I got out in 2008, that was a lot. Now there are people who've done five, six, or seven. And when I was, I initially got out after three tours. I was, I was out of off active duty and everything. And this was right when the surge was starting. And as I was getting ready to go for grad school, to grad school, I got a call from a friend of mine um, named Joe, who had gotten out of the Marines the same time I had. And when he got out, he came out of the closet. And he and I both got notices to come back on active duty. You know, FedEx package in the mail that says you've been recalled to active duty. And all Joe had to do was make one phone call and say two words, I'm gay, and he would not have had to go. And he asked me for my advice. You know, what did I think he should do? We talked about this for a while. And at the end of the day, Joe decided to hide a fundamental part of who he is so that nobody would have to go to this place. And he went back and did another tour in Afghanistan. And that kind of courage is exactly what's lacking in Congress today, where we refuse to even have a debate about the authorization for the use of military force, which is the formal term for Congress essentially declaring we weren't allowing um, these military conflicts to continue. We're, we're operating, as Dan said, under the authorization granted way back in 2001 for the continued war in Iraq, for the continued war in Afghanistan, for places like Syria that we didn't even contemplate going to back then. And the second point I'd like to make is that it's veterans, consistently veterans on both sides of the aisle, who are the ones who are speaking up in Congress and saying that we should have this committee. When you sit on the Armed Services Committee, it's amazing when you get to this point in the hearing and it's Republican and Democratic veterans standing up, often on our own, to say this is a debate that we have a constitutional responsibility to have and we should have. And you know what? Maybe the conclusion is that we do need to stay in Afghanistan, but let's at least have the debate. Veterans can help. Veterans can help. Hi. Um, I'm Sonia Kierens, and I want to make a comment and a question. Um, um, Dan 
was perceived by our kids in Palo Alto is one of the races that has to be won. They're looking around the country at Democrats and trying to lend support of their community. Dan went out there because they knew that this was a big race and they know that Minnesota is right in the center of this strategy to win. So I think it's important that people know far away they're looking at us and you in particular. Um, and then my question is, um, I want you to refresh my, my memory about how are the polls looking and what makes you confident regardless of what you're hearing with the polls? Why are you going to win? Yeah, no, that's a, probably have that conversation. All right, um, <laughs> so here, here are the realities of the district. Uh, in 2016, it uh, both first district elected Tim Walls by less than a point and went for, for President Trump by 15 points. Wow. After going for President Obama twice. <laughs> after going for President Bush twice. We are an independent-minded people <laughs> in southern Minnesota who are able to, to kind of hold two different thoughts in your head. And I believe that people at, at the end of the day are looking to see why Tim Walls has been elected six times over is because people are able to identify a sense that this person has a value of service and that he is he's there to serve others. And the thing that I hear consistently about Tim Walls is that I may not have agreed with him, but I respect the way he's coming from. And that, I had Tim Penny as a kid who was much fit in that same mold as well. Uh, for our own internal polling, uh, which is all that, it, that that we have to go off of thus far, we did that right after a primary and it had us in a dead heat. By the end of the poll, when you inform someone as to who we are, and the only thing I, my type of politics is not spend time talking about my opponent, but I will sum it up in a, in a certain, certain little bit here. Uh, the Washington Examiner, not the Post, but the Examiner, so not exactly a, a left-leaning publication, <laughs> called my opponent the worst GOP candidate in the country. <laughs> should Google it, it's, it's worth it, it's a good read. Um, but our contrast by the end of that poll, when, when hearing my own background, the story of service, and hearing what he has been, which is not a lot of great things, and a perennial candidate, this is his fourth time running for the seat, uh, we were ahead by 20 points by the end of it. Now, it's never gonna end up in that type of realm, but there's a, there's a consistent and clear pathway to victory, and that's telling a story of public service that conveys that I am an independent voice, that's there to make Congress a co-equal branch of government, as it's meant to be. Because the other thing, even though this district went for 15 points for Donald Trump, by far and above, when given the choice, do you want an extension of the Trump administration or do you want a check and balance? Check and balance wins by a mile. And that has only increased over time as we are in the middle of a trade war that has ruined and is ruining our economy. As people's health care costs have only risen over time. They're open to hearing a message, but it's not an anti-Trump message. It's very simply, what are you for? And how, what are the solutions you want to bring to it? And how are you able to work across the aisle with other people to get those things done? Which again, is if you're able to speak to the background there. And the way we're going to win is by having that message be far louder and stronger than any of the negative messages that are, going to, that are going to be there. And because of the fundraising success we've had so far, we've been up on the air in your, in your TV networks up here, but across the district to make that loud and clear. And that's, that's what's going to carry us. But it's not just that. It's the one anecdote I'll give you. We're linked to Minnesota. This is the reddest county in the district. This is Nobles County. Tim lost it, uh, and President Trump won it. It's also an incredibly changing place as well, where it is now was once 95% white, like a lot of Minnesota communities. It is now 60% white. It's changing rapidly, which is why we have a field office there to make sure we are doing that ground level organizing with communities of color and recent immigrants to turn that vote out and make it a possibility. And evidence of that making being a success, I was in a parade, it was 100 degrees on Saturday in Worthington. <laughs> Our float, the DFL float, had 80 people, the GOP had 12. The enthusiasm gap is already there and growing, we have to turn that into votes, and that's what organizing is at the end of the day, because you can't just throw your message up on TV, you've got to do the work on the ground. And that's, that is how we're going to win. Great. Send us up just one more really brief question. Okay, so you're doing this reading of and I watch C-SPAN, I don't know why, but it's a really shit show, like when you watch these hearings. And what is going to be different with you guys and, you know, that kind of leadership? Like, how do you do something there that's meaningful and change the environment? Well, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are a lot of structural problems with Congress. 
There's the influence of money in politics. There's a gerrymandering of districts that makes people very, very partisan. Uh, there's a primary process. You know, it's going to be interesting to see if these experiments in places like California and Oregon, uh, where they're doing jungle primaries, you know, sort of not by party, might actually create more moderate candidates. There's actually some good evidence that it will. It's a little too early to say. So there are a lot of structural issues that we need to that we need to fix about Congress. But in the meantime, I've seen every single day the difference that leadership can make. And I'll give you a good example. There are two of the most bipartisan.